So, uh, I don't know if you need to turn there, but I'm going to read a verse or two out of 1 John. Um, in case you don't know much about 1 John, let me just give you a little introduction to the book. Um, of course, John was one of the 12 disciples. He wrote five books of the New Testament, including the Gospel of John, the uh, Revelation of Jesus Christ, or you know, the book, book of Revelation, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Both uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians and 1st John uh, were written because there was an idea that developed in the church between 90 and 150 A.D. called Gnosticism. And it probably was around 150 A.D. before Gnosticism was a full-blown anti-Christian, cultic, uh, pseudo-Christian way of thinking. But the seeds of Gnosticism were beginning to enter some churches as early as 50 and 60 A.D., uh, all the books of the New Testament, contrary to uh, some modernistic way of thinking, were written before 70 A.D. And um, so 1 John was written partly to con uh, counteract neo-Gnostic ideas that were beginning to creep in the church. That's why the first four verses of 1 John uh, stress the physical reality of the incarnation so fully. And 1 John is a great book about measuring spiritual unreality versus spiritual reality. All of us, uh, after the sin of Adam and Eve, the human race was uh, uh, subject to a great deal of darkness. In our journey in Christ, as we are what's called sanctified progressively, as we are set apart more to God, as we are matured progressively, we're actually out of, on a journey out of spiritual darkness and living a life of, of, of a false reality and fantasy and living in an alternate world to reality into the world of truth. And Christ is the way, the truth, the life. That is, he's the path, he's the reality, uh, he's the very life of God. There's nothing worth anything outside of Christ. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, the, the image of God was not totally obliterated in mankind at the fall of man. So there's wonderful art and philosophy and so forth in this world. But uh, it's not going to lead you to knowing God, which is the whole point of all of life. So 1 John is a book you should use from time to time to measure whether where where if how much reality you're living in. First John says the one who says this but does this is a liar or is deceived. And first John is all about helping us come out of a condition that we are all subject to called self deception. And so uh, here's just a couple verses about prayer from first John. 1 John 3.22 says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. 1 John 5.14 and 15, I'm reading out of the ESV, by the way. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Notice that we can't just ask anything according to our will. You know, I, I will a really nicer car, you know, <laughs> uh, but I drive a 2010, but it's at least it's paid for one. You know, one of those you can put a bumper sticker, don't laugh, it's paid for. But, uh, uh, you know, I no longer have payments on this car and it still runs. Um, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. The key to getting amazing and miraculous results in prayer is to know the scriptures 
and to know the heart of God and to know the plan of God in the universe and to play accor pray according to his redemptive purposes. And when we do so, you can see some amazing things. Now, all this is just to have a plug that uh, uh, we have a prayer meeting at 8.30 every Sunday. Uh, a lot of the people who are involved in the worship can't come to that because that's the one time a week they practice, like John, Luke, Deanna, and Christiana, and different people like that. Uh, but um, we have a little core group of people that are there almost every week, including Roseanne, myself, uh, Amber Poon, and so forth. Melody comes quite often. Uh, but uh, a, a, we've had, I've had a sense for some time that God kind of wanted to use this prayer meeting to teach Sam Mawante some things about leadership and leading worship in general. So I had a talk with Sam uh, two or three weeks ago about being more consistent and doing a better job in leading it, and he kind of agreed to do that. And uh, so he's kind of had the songs better prepared, his spirit's better, been better prepared, and the fruit, like today, we had just a wonderful presence of God. It was awesome. And it carried into, I hope you noticed, uh, I, I know that we're coming out of death and into life, and there's some of us who are, are more sensitive to the Spirit of God than others and further along in that journey than others. But today there was a great sense of God's presence in the worship. And we need that more than we need oxygen. Let me repeat that. I'm not exaggerating. You, we need to experience the presence of God more than we need food, wine, oxygen, or any of the other great needs we have in life. Right? Uh, when, when you encounter God's presence and you grow in your ability to discern God's presence and your capacity to be filled with God's presence you begin to make progress in the, because the only, here's what the Christian life's about. There's one, we're on a journey and there's only one destination, more of Jesus. And so there's no stopping, you know, we, we will never attain to the fullness of that until we die and go to heaven. But in the meantime, we can always go further than we've gone up, up here to four. And uh, if we look back, we should be able to see that, we're, that we've come forward. But the proper place to keep looking is to look at Christ. And the more our life looks like Jesus, 1 John, another reality verse, says, in first, I think it's 1 John 2, 6, says, we, we know that uh, whoever says that he knows him ought himself to walk in the same manner that he walk. So you kind of need to ask yourself, like when you get done encountering a customer at your store or uh, when you get done mowing a lawn or when you get done talking to your wife, did they have an encounter with Jesus because they just talked to you? And if, if that's not the case, be encouraged that God wants to make that the case. And that's the, the, the purpose of our journey. So, um, uh, there, most, most Christians today, uh, most different flavors of evangelical and uh, at least more, most conservative types of Christians know that you can find Jesus in the scriptures some know that you can find Jesus in greater encounters and fillings and of the, with the Holy Spirit. But actually very few do, don't, mo most Christians totally underestimate how much Jesus is in his church. If you want to know Jesus, get to know John Gray and Amber Poon and uh, Deanna or whatever. <laughs> really, that's true. Um, there's things about God and Christ that I've encountered through many of you that I would have never otherwise encountered. And there's uh, Christ actually lives in his body. 
And part of the growth in Christ is to learn how to discern that and experience that through one another. Anyway, a little plug for the 8.30 prayer meetings. I know that Sam is going to stay faithful to uh, getting well prepared, and, and uh, I know that God's going to meet us in very powerful ways. Um, you know, the only problem we have at 8.30 is that we run out of time before we're done praying. And uh, hopefully we'll consider, continue to have that problem. So a little plug for that. All right. Praise the Lord today. Thank you, Greg. That's the perfect prerequisite to this message. Um, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7 and set them aside for a second. And if you would, if you could put a finger or a piece of paper or a pen in Exodus chapter 33, we'll go there next together. And as soon as you're just about there, we will pray. All right. Good morning. Thank you to each of you for being good to Leah and me. We, uh, you guys have loved us well, and it means so much. We're not going anywhere, I'm just saying. <laughs> Today, we're going to look at Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, part 2. When the righteous are taken away. Let's begin with prayer. Father, as, as the Son prayed in John 17, that his desire was that we would be with you where you are and to see your eternal glory. So, Lord, we pray now that even as the Holy Spirit mediates the presence of Christ and leads us to the Father right here, right now. We pray that you would dwell in our midst and within each of us in such a way that we see you, glorify you, savor you, and that we are transformed from the inside out. We pray that you would go with us and that your presence would give us rest. Thank you, Lord. Show us your glory. Amen. Let's look at Acts chapter 7, verse 54. The heading is the stoning of Stephen, at least in the NIV or something. Acts seven fifty four, yeah. And um, I want to read it and then read it again as if it were being reported in the newspaper. So Stephen has just given a gospel presentation telling the truth, the hard truth that really cuts to the chase to this council who hates God and uh, now hates him. And they hear it, they get it, they don't want to hear it, they cover their ears, they rush at him, and they throw rocks at him until he's dead. When they heard these things, they were enraged, and they gritted and gnashed and ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's a reference to the Psalms when it says that the Son of Man is seated on his throne ruling over all creation. That, that, that says that he saw with, with peace in his soul that the Lord eternally reigneth and that nothing is out of his hands. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Buried him, great lamentation. 
Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, imagine how these events might have been reported in a secular newspaper. Let's read it again. You know, local man murdered. You know, council condemns to death. Uh, you know, rabble rousing man. He, insurrectionist. He, he yelled as he was being put to death. Something. Nobody, nobody heard what they, what he said. He was thrown out of the city and put to death. The authorities, even the religious authorities, approved of his execution. Justice was done. And all of the sect of the Nazarenes, the Christians, were uh, scattered and they're being uh, uh, investigated and imprisoned. Nothing of the glory of God. If this were being reported maybe more sensationally, it would have been perhaps a little more graphic, descriptive of the violence done to him. It might look like the news. If you ever watch the news, you know, they're, you kind of hear local news with reports of a few local events interspersed with a few local murders and, you know, how things are going with drug trafficking in town and, you know, various arsons or robberies or whatnots. And there's more sensational, alarming, uh, scary things and there's no reporting at all, hardly ever, on anything that ministers peace to the soul. In this account, the verbiage used in verse 60 sets the tone for the whole passage. It says, Stephen fell asleep. It doesn't say he was murdered. It says, it doesn't say he had a terrible death or a shameful death, you know, cast out of the city and, you know, killed for his alleged crimes. It says he fell asleep. And that is in line with what's, what really happened in the passage. When we read these things, or if we go through things like this or imagine ourselves back in this story, if you imagine yourself in this, kind of picture it, Use your imagination and imagine you're standing there. This is a terrible thing. It's very upsetting. And then as chapter 8 begins, uh, you know, uh, Saul was ravaging the church. Uh, houses are being invaded. Homes are being invaded. And people are being dragged out of their homes and put in prison. This is all very upsetting. So why is this in the Scripture? And what's God trying to tell us here? Our goal today is to see what Stephen saw. Our goal today is to seek to see what Stephen saw. When all of this was happening, I tell you that he was not panicking. He was not filled with thoughts of retribution, retaliation, and we've got to bring down this evil regime. God was going to do that in, you know, maybe a few decades, right? That was all in God's hands, well within his hands. What filled his spirit was rest and a joy inexpressible, as Peter says in 1 Peter. He saw the glory of God. He gazed into heavens, the heavens, and what exactly did he see and what was it like? That's what we want to get. Because whatever Stephen saw completely changed his entire experience and his whole perspective on things that, if they were reported in the newspaper, we wouldn't see anything but awfulness about them. You know, like local mob violence and religious wars or whatever and strife and stuff. Stephen saw something that if we can see that too, we will be... We will be experiencing, knowing, doing, believing what and whom we were created to experience and know and believe in a way that we will have rest in our souls no matter what we go through. And in this world, we will have tribulation. In this world, we will have trouble. It might look like this. And we are here today to seek to see what Stephen saw. 
So, I have read this passage before, very literally, without before having experienced something of the glory of God, and I just read it kind of -of matter-of-factly. So here's how it might be reported in a dry, not spirit-filled, I'm going to say, Christian newspaper. Stephen, while he was being attacked, accused, um, saw clouds part, you know, rather suddenly, and he saw Jesus there, kind of like if you see Jesus in a painting, right? And then the Father there, and they were up there in the sky or in the clouds, and then, you know, he was killed, right? Have you ever read this before and read it in a totally plain way where you didn't get it, where at best it was like a color picture, a two-dimensional color picture. There's a, a sketch or a drawing of Jesus and you know, the Father one there, and there are clouds, and maybe a sunrise or a sunset or something. If you read this, and that's what you see, then you've read it with natural eyes, and we've missed the entire point. What Stephen saw was so much more than brightness or light. It was so much more than Jesus uh, really, really, you know, with like spotlights on him and lights behind him and the sun coming up behind him where you had to put on your sunglasses or even maybe your, you know, if you remember the eclipse a few years ago, they passed out those uh, solar viewing glasses. You know, this isn't a lot of light. This is a life-changing experience. When we glimpse God, we are forever changed. And in a few chapters, we're going to see when Saul... This Saul saw Jesus, and in his description, he says, you know, I saw like, you know, like the sun at noonday shining in all its brilliance, and, you know, and I was blinded by it. But what Saul really saw was something that completely changed him after he was involved in this execution and dragged all these uh, people off and threw them in prison. When Saul saw Christ What he saw was supernatural, and we need to seek to see that too. We need to seek earnestly to see the Lord like that each day of our lives, and especially when we're going through trouble, and we are going through trouble. Stephen saw the glory of God. What is that? Is it just light? No. The glory of God is all of his goodness which is wonderful beyond what we've ever seen, in a way that when I see him, he satisfies the deep longing of my soul in a way that nothing else can, because he is out of this world wonderful. And the peace and the joy and the delight that he brings makes the worst things in life seem worth enduring if I can just catch another glimpse of him. That's what happened in this account. And more of him, more of seeing him like that, is what we seek. Turn to Exodus chapter 33. This is also what Moses longed for. In Exodus 33, um, things are bad. Uh, Moses had a miserable life start to finish. He saw the glory of God and it was wonderful. Pretty much 100% of the rest of his life was terrible. So he had just gone up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments on which God wrote. And as soon as he came down from the mountain, the entire people that God had sent him to bring out of slavery and idolatry in Egypt had already taken the time, the energy, and invested all their gold in making this golden calf, and they were having something like a religious, like a cultish orgy worship party thing, uh, worshiping the calf and just playing, it says, or in revelry, it says in another translation. And Moses just witnessed that. It's like everything I've ever worked for is ruined. And then he says... In Exodus 33, um, verse 12, 
Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you. This is what was happening with Stephen when he was being accused and murdered. The presence of God was going with him in the midst of all that. And it completely transformed his experience from one of horror to one of being filled with, thrilled with joy and his spirit being at rest. And God said to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. And the people at this time with the golden calf and the idolatry there, they aren't very distinct from all the other nations, are they? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you, where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, chapter 34, verse 1, Cut for yourself two tablets. Verse 4, So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Notice that the name of the Lord isn't quite so simple as just a word or a name. His name is himself It's his glory and his goodness manifest in a name. And here, the Lord has to use a whole paragraph to say what his name is. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands or thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. The deep cry of Moses' heart in the middle of all his trouble was to see the glory of God. And what does it say at the end of Exodus 33? While my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you there with my hand, like it says in the old hymn, until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I think this experience with God kept him going for the rest of his life. This is what Moses longed for and what David asked for in Psalm 27, verse 4. How many of you know Psalm 27 pretty well? You know how it starts out? Let's flip there real quick. So David lived, generally, a terrible life in the sense that His life was filled with troubles. People hunted him 
He had commandos after him, like special forces out looking for him as he ran for his life and hid in like arid places where it was really hard to find water. And then local villagers who he helped like protect from bandits while he was there would send messages to Saul, up, oh, we found him, you know, send the commandos. And then the commandos would come and, they'd, and Saul would come and, and hunt him. And David was always running for his life. That's from his father-in-law. And there's so much more that was miserable about David's life from start to finish. And Psalm 27 is a psalm about how whether, whether uh, evildoers assail me or a whole army encamps against me, or even war, that's like all the armies in the country, breaks out against me, I will be confident in the Lord. So he's living in a reality where everybody is, it's like everybody is trying to kill him. But like almost everybody is trying to kill him. And he's constantly running from the edge of the sword and arrow and spies and those who would do him harm and harm follows him. And he, when he goes to bed, he, he lies down and thinks every, on a nightly basis, perhaps, if I close my eyes, I wonder if anybody will sneak up and kill me tonight. And he has to battle those level of fearful thoughts as he goes to sleep. Have you ever had fear to that level? Some of us have. And, and so he writes psalms like Psalm 3 and Psalm 4, which if you're scared at night, um, you should read those before going to sleep, Psalms 3 and 4 and 6 and 5. It's hard for me to keep them straight. Read Psalms 3 and 4 and 5. Yeah, I read them to my kids, so. And I read them myself and recite them. Sometimes I'm scared. In all of these things, you might think that David's one prayer would be, God, please kill my enemies, or please at least stop them, or please at least like make them sick or something so that you know they're bedridden or whatever. There's only one thing in Psalm 27 that David is asking for. He's like expressing confidence in the Lord, like people are coming to get me, you know, an army is coming to get me, war is breaking out against me. And then he prays for only one thing. He says, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple or to take time to pray in the temple. All he wants to do is gaze upon the face of God. All he wants in life is to see his glory. This is the one thing David sought after. This is also what Jesus prayed for us on the eve of his crucifixion, knowing that he was going to intense torment and struggle. And in, and in getting ready for that, he had one thing on his mind. And in John 17, he prays, he prays for us, and one of the only things that he prays for us is in John 17, 24. There are a few things, unity and so on. He prays that we also would see his glory. Turn to John 17, 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, that's every generation of Christians, every generation of disciples until the end of time. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. And I tell you that that prayer Jesus prayed was answered for Stephen in this passage we just read, who saw the glory of God. He beheld the Lord high and lifted up like Isaiah did. And then he was immediately taken away from all his trouble and into the presence of God, which was the greatest gift the Lord could have given him. So Stephen beheld the glory of God and then was taken into glory. He was welcomed into the presence of God. Life is full of troubles, but those troubles will end. And God will bring justice in his timing. 
at the end of our lives, no matter how we die. Those who obey his commands and endure with him to the end will have this to look forward to. An entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Peter 1.11, Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or in the ESV, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we see that the hope of glory is greater than all other hopes and indeed is greater than life and death, greater than all our troubles, and it cannot be taken away from us. And when the righteous are taken away, when godly people suffer and die, We who are left behind are left with their example of being patient in suffering and the example of what they hoped for. We have the example of Moses, of David, of Christ, of Stephen, and the rest of the apostles who were martyred for their faith and their faithful witness without renouncing Christ. Their hope was to see the glory of God. And they all saw God's glory, and their thirsty souls were satisfied as they gazed upon the goodness of God. You were made to behold God. You were made to glorify God while on earth and to be taken into his presence forever where you will never tire of looking at his face, seeing him in his glory, for there is no greater thing. And in Acts 7, Stephen knew this so deeply that while they were trying to kill him, all he could see, all he could pay attention to was the Lord. You see, the glory of God makes everything else in life, no matter how loud it is, seem to fade into the background. In Acts 8, verse 2, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. They did not accuse God of wrongdoing. They grieved over him while he rejoiced in glory. When loved ones and old saints and sometimes young saints are translated into glory, we pause for a season of grief but we do not grieve like those who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet, the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That means in the presence of God. Like when he gazed into the sky, Stephen gazed into the clouds, he saw him will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Remember when God descended in the cloud. It was his presence. This isn't like a painting of Jesus in the sky. Don't think about flying through the air. That's not what this is saying. This is saying you'll be with him in glory. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 
While we endure trouble and persecution, we likewise fix our gaze on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we long both to see his glory in the church as all things are being restored, and we long for that day when we shall see him face to face. And when we see him, we shall be like him. Moses could not see his face and live. Moses today is gazing at the face of God as every one of us who endure with him to the end will. As the communion servers come forward, pray with me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would comfort us in seasons of loss and grief and help us to pause and rest in you. And we pray, pray Lord, over, um, over the families of uh, those who are grieving in this way and relatives and friends. We ask for your grace. We pray that you would open our eyes to see you as you are and that you would show us your glory and your goodness again and again and again. And we ask that you would put in our hearts to seek your face like David sought your face and like Moses longed to see you. And like Christ prayed, we pray that his prayer would be fulfilled in this generation, that we would not only be with you in your presence in the church, but that we would see your glory here and now, even as we long for that day when all things will be fulfilled. In Jesus' name, amen.